Well, first of all, just to sketch out, this, this book really is a zoom-in shot of a period running from around October 1952 to June 1953. And um, it's a very rich kind of take on this very dense period. But I think there's, there's only one natural place to start, which is the end of February, beginning of March 1953, where on the 28th of February, almost 70 years ago to the day, Stalin is in his dacha. He's watching a movie with his inner circle. They're drinking. They have a late night. They leave at around 5 a.m. And then a few days later, this announcement is issued by the Kremlin that something has gone wrong. And on the 5th of March, the world learns that Stalin had died. And what happened in between these two dates is still shrouded in secrecy. And I was wondering, Joshua, if you could begin by just stepping us through what, what occurred. Sure, thank you. Thank you, Edward. And thank to our host here at the American Library in Paris for hosting the program. Um, well, my, my book begins happily, unlike many books about Soviet history, it begins with Stalin's death and ends happily with the execution of La Grande Beria. So unlike most books on Soviet history, it begins happily and it ends happily. So on the night of February 28th, Stalin is with his closest colleague, just a handful of men from the Presidium. It had changed from the Politburo to the Presidium in the fall. And as was Stalin's habit, he liked to watch Westerns. And we know now that typically when they were watching a Western in the Kremlin, Molotov would stand next to the screen and he would give a running commentary. Look, they're chasing the Indians. Look, they fell down. Look, they fell off their horse. And that was a typical evening in the Kremlin with Stalin. And then when the movie was over, he would invite them to dinner at his dacha in Puntsevo, which is about, let's say, eight or 10 miles outside of Moscow. It was an invitation they could, they could not refuse. Stalin was a very was getting old. He was actually uh, about uh, actually seventy four, although he changed his birth date, so he was now officially seventy three. We don't have no idea why he did that in, in the early nineteen twenties. Um, and he invited his colleagues to dinner after midnight, and they stayed till as late as five in the morning. Stalin was nocturnal. He would work at night sleep halfway during the sleep midday the next day. And so the others went home and they actually expected to get a phone call from Stalin on Sunday, March 1st, but no phone call came. In the meantime, the guards at the dacha expected to get a bell, hear a bell from Stalin asking for tea, asking for breakfast that morning. That, was, that would be typical, but they didn't hear any invitation from Comrade Stalin. They didn't hear any coughing. They didn't hear any footsteps coming from the other side of the door. The rule was they were never allowed to enter his private quarters unless they were invited. That was part of the security arrangement at the dacha. So the day wore on. They got increasingly anxious. Around 10 at night, they asked an elderly woman who had worked in the dacha for a long time as a kind of maid to go into his private quarters with the mail and other official documents. And the logic was that if he was okay and saw her, he wouldn't grab a gun and shoot her. He wouldn't be so startled to see her. But in fact, it was uh, this woman who found Stalin on the floor in his private quarters, lying in his own urine, not able to speak, paralyzed on one side of his body, his right side. And they, she immediately alerted the guards. The guards rushed in. They lifted him onto a sofa. Did they call the doctors? No. They called the other leaders. They called Malenkov and Beria. And they made it out there by one or two in the morning. According to Khrushchev's memoirs, Stalin was asleep and snoring. And so Beria got angry at the guards. Why were you so alarmed? Why were you so nervous? Why are you bothering us? Look at Comrade Stalin. He's fine. He's asleep. So they left. Now, the question immediately arises, 
He was lying in his urine. The guards knew something was wrong. No one called the doctors. Did Beria and Khrushchev and Malenkov leave hoping nature would take its course? Or did they honestly think that in the morning Stalin would awaken, they'd learn an explanation for why he was out of sorts and life would go on? We really don't know how to answer that question. But by seven or eight in the morning, the guards realized that something wrong was seriously happening. They called the leadership again and only then were the doctors summoned. So that's very, that's one important point. There was a, a deliberate delay, for whatever reason, in calling the doctors. Secondly, they made a point of asking the doctors, once it was clear that Stalin was going to die, the doctors assured them they had a very serious stroke and there was no treatment able to save him. The leadership asked the doctors, you must prolong his life long enough for us to sort out who's gonna lead what ministry, who will be head of security, who will be the foreign minister, who will be taking care of the army, so that when we tell the population what's happened, we can assure them life is going on and we will, we will proceed with everything being in good shape. So that's what the doctors did. Nothing was said publicly until late after midnight on March 4th. Then Radio Moscow made an announcement that Comrade Stalin had suffered a serious stroke that he was under the, super, under the serious medical supervision of the Central Committee. And the doctors who signed the bulletin, the medical bulletin that appeared in Pravda the next day, none of them could be Jewish. Interesting, there are a dozen doctors signed the bulletin. None could be Jewish, why? Because just six weeks earlier, on January 13th, the doctor's spot had been announced. That a group of Jewish of doctors, most of them Jewish, had been conspiring with Zionists, they didn't use the word Israel, they didn't refer to Israel by name, had been conspiring with Zionists and Western imperialists, you know who that is, to undermine the health of the Soviet leadership. And they gave a few more details. And that started a whole tsunami of propaganda in the country against the Jewish doctors that caused a great deal of anxiety throughout the country and among the Jewish population of the Soviet Union. And that very much influenced Stalin's care and, and what could be announced publicly about his care. The leadership had to assure the population that Stalin was sick in a natural way, and that when he died on the night of March 5th, that he succumbed to natural causes. They wanted to assure the population that they didn't want to cause any kind of reaction against Jews or any kind of panic in the country. So that, that animated and influenced their public reaction to Stalin's illness. Thank you, and it's, um, it's worth saying Stalin's personal doctor, I think, was among the, the Jewish doctors who had been caught in the scope of this witch hunt. So well, Vladimir them... Vinogradov was not Jewish, but he was arrested in the fall of 1952 in the months leading up to the doctor's plot, and he was held in chains. So that was the personal position of Stalin, who had recommended to Stalin that the year before that he retire because of his severe hypertension, severe high blood pressure. It was not a suggestion Stalin took seriously. And so at the end of the day, when Stalin does die, the cause of death, as far as we're aware, um, I think just, just to say and be clear, it's, it's a stroke, right? That, which yes. is then untreated. But with all these circumstances which you've alluded to, the, the physician that should be on hand or not, and it's allowed to grow worse over the following day. No, I wouldn't say it was a lie. I wouldn't go that far. Keep in mind, he had hypertension for several years. There were no drugs, no medicines like we have today to deal with high blood pressure. The doctors treated him as best they could as far as we know. They used whatever medical tools they had, and they used traditional medicine. They put leeches on his ears, on the back of his neck, in order to draw blood and attempt to reduce the uh, high blood pressure. That was a traditional medical practice. It was one of re reassuring the Russian population. They were trying to do all the means they had. So I think the doctors did the best they could. There's no reason to believe otherwise. But there's one un unusual detail about his treatment. 
one of the American journalists um, would drive around Moscow just to get a feel for life in the city. And, you know, he often drove in and around Red Square. He noticed there were trucks bringing medical equipment with nurses and people who looked like doctors delivering this medical equipment to some area in the Kremlin, as if Stalin were there. And when they announced that he had fallen ill, they collapsed. They said he fell ill in his Kremlin office, which was a deliberate lie. Stalin collapsed at the dacha, at the country house outside of Moscow. But the myth was that Stalin was always working for the people. And the light in his office that shone on to Red Square was always on, day and night, as if that's where Stalin could always be found, which is, of course, far from the truth. So then, 5th of March, 1953, Stalin dies. Let's talk about the reaction in the Soviet Union to that moment. Um, the book does a wonderful job of taking us through many different constituents of people who had a vested interest in his life and death. Um, but the ordinary people, I mean, how did they, how did they take the loss of their great leader? I think one of the mysteries that we in the West uh, have to confront why so many people were upset when Stalin died and found themselves crying. We know from memoirs that, for example, Andrei Dmitrievich Sakharov, the famous dissident, who played a major role in developing the Soviet hydrogen bomb though at that time, Sakharov admitted that he, he, he was in tears when he learned about, Sakharov, about uh, Stalin's death, that it was so shocking to people. Um, we have memoirs of, of uh, men and women who had been in the gulag, who had been prisoners, reporting how the guards collapsed. The, and the guards were under, and the other prisoners said, well, how could Stalin die? No one of importance could die without Stalin's permission. <laughs> that was their logic. So they couldn't understand it. Uh, I was very friendly with a few as uh, Edward mentioned, I wrote a book on the Soviet dissident movement. Uh, a woman who just recently died with Mila Alexeyeva was a close friend of mine. She was in her 20s back in 19, 1953, and she admitted crying. And she became a very famous dissident. People were just overwhelmed at the thought that this person was at the center of their existence. Much more than any premier or president becomes part of our consciousness, whether we like it or not. But Stalin was the heart and soul of their everyday lives. And the idea of moving forward without him seemed impossible. That it, it, uh, uh, Konstantin Simonov, a well-known and very accomplished Soviet writer, wrote when these bulletins started appearing, he said he couldn't, he couldn't understand the logic that Stalin was someone with, with blood pressure. <laughs> you know, he could get a cold. He would get a cough like any normal human being, that he was outside of those parameters. And that affected people's, people's psychology of accepting this break, this dramatic break in their lives. That's genuine, genuine grief. I mean, well, genuine grief and genuine confusion about what's next. Yeah, I, I mean, there's a wonderful quote from Gudmila Alexeyeva, like she in the book, where I think she, she captures some of the turmoil of emotions that people were, fee uh, were feeling at that time. She said, we cried because we were helpless. We cried because we had no rational way of predicting what would happen to us now. We cried because we sensed that for better or worse, an era had passed. I love the way that quote both conveys the real sadness, but also the sense of bewilderment and, and helplessness and vulnerability. There's one little anecdote I found in um, uh, Alexander Nekrich was a well-known uh, Soviet historian who emigrated to the West in the, I believe in the 80s. And he was at the Institute of History and there were all these meetings to commemorate Comrade Stalin. And some, some middle-aged guy got up and said, he was practically in tears, you know, my five-year-old came to me asking, how can we go on living without Comrade Stalin? And Nekrich's comment was that everyone was so felt the need to artificially express their grief that even this father would abba abase himself and invoke his five-year-old daughter to explain his grief. It was obviously insincere, but something the guy felt he had to say. Um, 
So then um, Stalin's body is laying in state. I thought we could turn to that moment because that's quite a chaotic process as it happens. His, his body is put on display for three days, which is I think, a nod to what had happened to Lenin's body after yeah. he died. And then these crowds of people start coming. Um, I read that in your book, there's, there's a 10 mile crowd of, of well wishes. I thought to myself, that's an incredibly long line. Yeah. And then I looked up the queue for the Queen of England, and that was 10 miles as well. But this is this is not an orderly line. This is people crushing in, isn't it? And yes, and, and how has that process unfolded? Yes. So Stalin dies on the fifth. By midday on the sixth, his body, or by about three o'clock in the afternoon, his body is put on display in the House of Unions in the Hall of Columns. It's one of the most august interior spaces in Moscow. That's where Lenin's funeral was held. That's where the trial of Gary Powers was held after his U2 was shot down in the early 1960s. We now believe, according to Khrushchev, that during those three days, the 6th, the 7th, and the 8th, well over 100 people were trampled to death in the streets and squares of Moscow. Not because there was panic, but the police lost control of the crowds. There were so many armored vehicles lining both sides of the streets that there wasn't enough room for the crowds to make their way down, say, Gorky Street or through, through Naya Square, and people were crushed to death. Uh, Yevgeny Yatushenko was a very young man at that time, but he was part of the crowd and wrote very vividly about his experience. And he was tall and he felt, he physically felt he could survive it, but he recalled stepping on people. Couldn't help it. There was such a crush of people. And um, another famous dissident later wrote about his experience, Andrei Sinyavsky. Sinyavsky said that the the drama of the crowds and people dying, for him, that was Stalin. That represented Stalin. And if it were up to Stalin, he would have dragged everyone with him into the grave. And there are also, I mean, th throughout this book, so many wonderful touches of, 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 of comedy, really, to, to appreciate as well. And one bit I loved is um, for an, an account from David Oistrak, who is one of the musicians sitting next to the catafalque where the body was on display. And he's playing like the same slow movement from the same Tchaikovsky quartet for like three days on a row. And they're barely given any food or drink. I mean, for the musician, it's, it's a real ordeal just to survive that. In and of itself. Yeah, um, some needed to be poked to keep awake. Um, and the very prominent musicians were Rostropovich's sister was a violinist. She was there. Um, and there are many cute anecdotes about what it was like for them behind the scenes. Oistrak brought a chess set. And during the, their time off from playing, he would surreptitiously play chess with other musicians to pass the time. Um, Oistrak had also been recruited to play for Prokofiev's funeral. Sergei Prokofiev died on the same evening as Stalin, also of a stroke. And the Soviet press did not mention it for several days. There were no cut flowers to honor Prokofiev. All cut flowers in the country were requisitioned to be brought to Moscow for Stalin's funeral. Now, let me remind you of something somewhat similar. When JFK was assassinated in Dallas, on November 22nd, Aldous Huxley also was dying and passed away. And the press was so consumed with the events surrounding the assassination of JFK that Aldous Huxley's death went unremarked for several days. Obviously a major cultural figure in the West. So that can happen. Um, but as it played out in Moscow, Oistrak was at Prokofiev's, and they had to have a phalanx of police to help him get through the crowds to get to the House of Unions where he was expected to play. He, by himself, he would never have been able to carry his violin to make it unscathed through the crowds to the House of Unions. Okay, so then Stalin's body goes off to the advance to be richly mummified uh, and taken to the, the Red Square Mausoleum to lie beside, beside Lenin's. Um, I thought we could take a moment to talk about the political consequences in the Soviet Union at this time. Um, 
you have a line in your book where you Stalin is now off off scene and you're surveying the inner circle and you say it is doubtful that a more murderous gang would ever exercise greater power in the course of modern history than Stalin and the men he personally assembled. And uh, what next is is the big question. And, and I think one of the most interesting aspects of this whole story is that the internecine strife, the civil conflict that Ilya Ehrenberg and others were most afraid of doesn't actually come right. to pass. And, and instead, um, can you talk a little bit about what does happen and in particular the process of reform that is up Well, on? let me uh, point out some of the background here because it's not only important to focus on what was going on in Moscow. In November of 1952, Dwight David Eisenhower was elected president of the United States. He was the first Republican president in 20 years after Franklin Delano Roosevelt and Harry Truman. And Eisenhower and his, well, and John Foster Dulles, who became the Secretary of State, rejected the policy of containment that Truman had instituted under the advice of George Kennedy. They felt that was too passive. They also thought that Roosevelt at Yalta and Truman at Potsdam had conceded too much to the Soviet leaders, to Stalin. So they instituted a new politics, a politics of rolling back communism. Remember, we're going to roll back communism. So they took a much more confrontational approach rhetorically. At the same time, Winston Churchill is once again prime minister of England. And as soon as Eisenhower is elected, Churchill you know, cables Eisenhower, you should meet with Stalin. You should meet with Stalin to reduce tensions over Berlin, to deal with this hot war in Korea. You met him before, after the war, this is the time to step up and try something dramatic. Eisenhower knew, knew Churchill and was very polite to Churchill, but Eisenhower had no confidence in himself and he would sit down with the Soviet leaders, he thought he'd be stymied in the same way Roosevelt and Truman had been. And Foster Dulles was absolutely opposed to any attempt to sit down with either Stalin or with the new leadership after Stalin's death. So Eisenhower believed firmly, and so did Foster Dulles and Nixon, who was the vice president, and others. Now, this is hard to believe, they thought Stalin was a moderating force in the leadership. Now, once Stalin was gone, Malenkov and the others would be much harder to deal with. They would be more difficult, more severe, more confrontational with the West. The opposite was the case. Within weeks, it was the Soviet leadership that alerted the Chinese and the North Koreans that we need to renew negotiations over the war that led to the armistice that was signed in the summer of 1953 at Panmunjom, the same armistice that governs the peninsula today. By the end of March, they released over a million prisoners, all criminals, not political prisoners, which resulted in a tremendous surge of crime in Soviet cities and villages, which upset many people. Nonetheless, it was not a moral decision. They saw the gulag as a waste of money, a waste of resources. So they immediately moved to reduce the number of prisoners in the camps in exile. They also took measures in Berlin to reduce tensions, both symbolic and substantial. All of these were signals to the West. Deal with us. We're ready to sit down with you. Um, the name of the Ehrenberg has come up a couple of times. I wrote a biography of Ehrenberg on May 1st, May Day. Ehrenberg wrote an article, obviously at the behest of the leadership, saying the time for monologues is over. The time for dialogue has arrived. This was a direct signal to the West to engage with the new leadership. So I do believe that Eisenhower, that there was a window of opportunity. I don't understand, overstate how wide it was. There was a window of opportunity for Eisenhower and Foster Dulles to meet with the new Soviet leadership, an opportunity they dismissed. And I think you know, this is one of the real strengths of the book as well, by being so zoomed in on the month-to-month the -month developments 
you're able to stop and consider the what might have been or the other possibilities that people had playing around in their minds. Um, and, and so regarding that opportunity that you talked about, is there a kind of alternative course of events that you think is particularly likely that, that didn't happen because of Eisenhower and Dallas? You know, it's very easy to think of what might have been. Uh, thanks to the Soviet initiative, the war in Korea, we reached an armistice. The, the peninsula is still divided. It's tremendous um, military presence on both sides. North Korea is this unusual pariah state, but nonetheless, there's no active war, which is a good thing. You know, we're coming up to 70 years since Stalin's death. And if I may take a moment to step back, look at those 70 years, look at the changes with Khrushchev, and Brezhnev and eventually Gorbachev, the, the pendulum swinging from a more conservative oriented regime to a more what's called liberal minded regime. The Stalin period we call a, a period of cannibalism, switching to a period of vegetarianism. And yet 70 years later with all of those changes, we're at the most dangerous moment in all of those 70 years because of the war in Ukraine, and because of the continued crackdown in Moscow by Putin on every independent voice, either organized or otherwise. So what could have accomplished in that spring, in the summer of 1953, that might have changed subsequent years? Very hard to say. And I don't want to appear to be overly optimistic about what could have happened. But the fact is, they didn't take up that opportunity. <laughs> Now, Eisenhower later said, we didn't know who to meet with. We were supposed to meet with Malenkov, who's reputed to be the number one. We insist on meeting with Vyacheslav Molotov, the famous foreign minister who had been lost that position to Vyshinsky and then was restored to foreign minister, who had negotiated with Hitler and Ribbentrop. Is that the man we should sit down with? So they didn't want to agree to meet with a Soviet leader, and by agreeing, be the ones to anoint that leader as the presumed heir, principal heir to Stalin. Now that's legitimate logic on the part of the Americans. But from what I can tell, that's only something Eisenhower wrote down a year later in 54. As far as I can tell, he never raised that kind of question. It may have been on their minds. Maybe somewhere in the archives, there is such a document. But what is clear is that Eisenhower refused to take up Churchill's invitation, Churchill's encouragement to meet with the Soviet leader. And so I think something could have been accomplished. Um, they were ready. They understood that Stalin had led the country into a dead end. And they were trying to find a way out of it. So let's talk about how this window ends and, and the kind of final weeks that the book is, is primarily concerned with in the summer of 1953. And I think here, useful context is what's happening elsewhere in the Soviet bloc, but outside the Soviet Union in, in Central and Eastern Europe. Um, and in particular, the fact that Stalin's death actually led to a series of protests in Bulgaria, in Czechoslovakia, and most significantly in, in East Germany. And maybe you could talk a little bit about the East German context. Well, um... There were strikes by workers in Bulgaria, many of the tobacco factories. As far as we can tell, it had no political overtones. It strictly had, had to do with the economic situation and their salaries and their workloads. But in the Czech in, in Czechoslovakia, in Pilsen, um, there were riots for several days that had a very definite political tone to them. They tore up party headquarters. They ripped up files, they threw portraits of Czech leaders out the window, and army units had to be sent to Pilsen uh, to, to uh, arrest everybody and, and take control of the city. So that was the first really violent, uh, up, up, uprising is too strong a word, but violent reaction in the wake of Stalin's death in Eastern Europe. And then on June 16th, we begin to see riots, not just in East Berlin, people thought People today remember, oh, it was all in East Berlin. It was in hundreds of cities throughout East Germany, including all the major industrial cities. And it required Soviet army units to come in 
to put down these rioters. And many people were killed, many were arrested. And uh, this was, of course, the end of any opportunity for dialogue at that moment between Western leaders and Soviet leaders. So the, really the window of opportunity is from, at most, Stalin's death March 5th or Eisenhower's speech April 16th, the chance for his peace, and two months later, the riots in East Germany. So we're not talking about a very wide window of opportunity. These summits take a long time to prepare. And usually everything they're going to discuss is laid out on the table beforehand, and everything they will agree to is already outlined before such a summit takes place. That's how things go. So would there have been such time? Hard to say. But I do believe something could have been. Some kind of dialogue could have been an issue. And back to back to the Moscow and, and the heart of the Soviet government. Um, I think what may surprise some listeners who are familiar with Beria as the police chief of Stalin, the, the kind of henchman, key right-hand man, is that he was actually part of some of the most uh, optimistic moves on the Soviet side in, in reaching in, uh, out towards the Americans throughout this whole process. Um, why, why do you think it was that Beria, who you know, played such an instrumental role in the terror and the deportations of Soviet populations during World War II, was at the helm during this period in making these openings? Beria was very capable. And as the longtime security chief, he knew better than most people what the situation was in the country. He was well aware that his own reputation was one of deep cruelty. So Barry was among the most, led the way in initiating many of the most important reforms. For example, we mentioned the doctor's club. On April 4th, the Soviet press announced the doctors were innocent. They were all being released. They had been mistreated. This was in a very small article on an inside page of Pravda. Two days later, there was a more there was a much longer column on the front page of, of Pravda giving more details about why the doctors were being released, about how they were mistreated, mean tortured, and blaming secu various security heads, not barrier, for, for creating this case. Now, anyone reading these articles would understand that if the doctors were innocent, then Stalin was the one who was guilty. He was guilty of a crime far more serious than what the doctors had been accused of doing. But the regime made public the fact that they were releasing the doctors, that the whole thing had been a sham. And Barry was very much behind them. When the doctors' plot had been announced, so the, the tale you may not be familiar with, a man named Solomon Mihoyles was denounced as being one of the people in cahoots with the doctor. Who was Mihoyles? Mihoyles was the, was the director of the Yiddish State Theater, the Jewish State Theater in Moscow, an official theater in the Yiddish language. Mihoyles had been assassinated on, on Stalin's personal orders on January 13, 1948. His death, then it was, uh, said to have been in a tragic road accident in Minsk. And he had a public funeral, public funeral, with all kinds of articles lauding Mihoyles, bemoaning his loss. Five years later to the day, Mihoyles is blamed for being one of the people incriminated with the doctors. After Stalin's death, the, the decree against Mihoyles was rescinded and was announced in the same articles, praising the doctors, announcing their release. So Mihoyles was rehabilitated posthumously. They couldn't revive him, but posthumously he was rehabilitated. His son-in-law, who's a well-known com composer, Mitchislav Weinberg, was still in jail another month to go before he was released. So, and everything in the Soviet Union is unlimited in possibility. And uh, so Mihoyles is rehabilitated, his son-in-law stays in jail another month, the doctors are released, all kinds of un un unexpected uh, reforms, announcements are appearing in the Soviet press, and various a part of that. And one small detail, 
We mentioned Vyacheslav Molotov, who had been a longtime famous foreign minister. At the time of Stalin's death, his wife was a prisoner. Why? Because when Golda Meir came to Moscow in the fall of 1948 as the first Israeli ambassador, she attended a reception for the, for the anniversary of the revolution at the Albanian embassy, where Molotov's wife was there to talk with. And Goldemir did not know who Pauline Shemchushna was. So she asked her, why do you have such interest in Israel? Why are you asking about the Kibbutzim? And Pauline Shemchushna answered in Yiddish, Ich bin Yiddish Atachter, I'm a daughter of the Jewish people. Stalin was informed of their conversation, which was much too friendly than would have been ordinarily permitted. Shemchushna was arrested. Molotov was forced to divorce his wife. Is the man who was the foreign minister of the country. And she lived in Central Asia for several years, was brought back to Moscow and associated with another case. And on March 10th, the day after Stalin's funeral, she was presented and restored to Molotov by burial. Such was life in Stalin's kingdom. When I lecture about the book and people are shaking their heads, how could this be possible? I tell an American audience, and I, I assume many of us are Americans, that imagine if during the Iraq war, Colin Powell's wife had said something untoward about George W. Bush at a cocktail party in Georgetown. And the next day, Colin Powell's wife had been arrested and sent to Wyoming. That's what it was like. Colin Powell had stayed in post until, uh, right. until the end. So maybe we could um, finish these questions before we get to the audience with, with the downfall of Beria. And, and why is it that Beria is not the one who wins and it's Khrushchev right. who, who takes the reins of power? We know now, mostly from Khrushchev's own memoir, that even while Stalin lay dying at the dacha, Khrushchev very quietly begins to discuss what to do about Beria with the other leaders, with Malenkov, with Bulganin, eventually with Molotov. Khrushchev understood that he and Beria were the two likely rivals in pursuit of, re of inheriting the crown, so to speak, from Stalin, both by their intelligence, their capacity, their, their relative ages, Khrushchev had survived Stalin. He wanted to survive Beria. And that's how they saw it. So even while Stalin lay dying, he began speaking with the others very discreetly. Now keep in mind, Beria is restored the head of security, both internal security and border security. The security of the Kremlin was in his hands. No one could just walk into the Kremlin carrying a gun, in, including any army officer. So to, to, to arrange, to conspire against Barry took a lot of guts and a lot of nerve and a lot of intelligence, how to do it discreetly. And they weren't able to arrest Barry until June 26th. And they blamed the riots in East Germany on Barry as if he were to blame for it. And they didn't announce publicly his arrest for two more weeks. But the day after his arrest, a signal was given to the Soviet population. How? The entire presidium, all the members of the leadership, attended the Bolshoi Theater. And their names were listed in the newspapers the next day as having been in attendance. But one name was not there, Lavrenti Pavlovich Beria. And people who read the newspapers carefully understood something had happened. We don't know what, we'll find out soon enough. He was arrested. And then of course, over the next few weeks, they blamed him for being a British spy, a Japanese spy, a French spy, an American spy, someone who never was a communist, who hated Comrade Stalin. They used all the incriminating uh, accusations they had used in the purge trials in the 1930s because they had no other bag of tricks. The problem was that Barry was one of the most honored people in the country. Entire cities, his name was covering squares and statues and buildings. And he wasn't brought to a secret trial to December, a trial that lasted six days, 
A military officer was the judge, it was not a civilian trial. It was executed the day the trial ended. The postscript is, <clears throat> I'm sure some of you who studied Soviet history are aware of this very unusual anecdote. The great, the second edition of the great Soviet encyclopedia had begun to be issued during that time. Now it's not the way it's not, it was not issued or published the way we would publish an encyclopedia of many volumes, all at once. No, the great Soviet encyclopedia would come out one volume at a time. So they were up to five or six volumes, and Bay for Barry was among the initial volumes. So already in libraries and people's homes was a very long adulatory article about Barry with this full page picture, color photograph. So what do they do about that? So all the subscribers to the, the great Soviet encyclopedia were sent a letter with the following instructions. Take a scissors or a razor, take off, delete these pages, and insert this much longer article on the Bering Straits. George Orwell could not have created a more memorable memory hole than the Soviet leadership did as an epilogue to Bering's execution. Can you have a big round of applause, please? Thank you, Edward. Thank you, Dr. Are there any inputs and questions, comments, thoughts? Yes. A uh, couple of questions. Sure, sure please. Very special. So, first of all, uh, uh, what's your take on the film, uh, The Death of Stalin? It's, it's a comedy, but it's also supposed to be accurate. I, and if I may refer to the second question, so I'm sure you're familiar with the work of Stephen Kotkin yes. on Stalin. Uh, he wrote a biography of Stalin. And Professor Kotkin claims. That everything that Stalin did, the doctor plot that you just described, the purges, the Moscow trial, the killings, the killing of his own comrades, Bukhari, and all these people, it was driven by an ideology, by a real belief in communism, not <coughs> madness or power for power's sake. So, do you agree with that? I don't. Um, first, about the movie, I've seen it three times. Um, <laughs> when you know the real story, you can appreciate how much the movie is grounded in what really happened. It's, as extravagant as the comedy is, my only, it's not really a disagreement, but I, it's, it's unnerving to watch these men being portrayed as clowns. They were not clowns. Only Beria is portrayed as more, in a more serious way, in a more sinister way. But other than that, uh, I thought it was great. Um, and I re highly recommend it to everyone after you've read the book. <laughs> um, secondly, um, Steve, Professor Kotkin at Princeton still has not issued his third volume. So we don't know exactly how he's going to write about the last years of Solomon's life, the doctor's plot. Um, I don't believe that it was all about ideology. I certainly was driven in part by ideology. But for someone to, to murder untold millions, including people he was close to, including family members, um, to be cruel on that scale requires much more than um, being driven by ideology. It requires something wrong inside of him that was always there. That once having that kind of power uh, leads him to the most sinister ends. Now, I'll also remind you, uh, George Orwell lived long enough, um, or I should say Trotsky lived long enough to get the attention of George Orwell. And Orwell wrote about Trotsky very briefly in 1940, in the months leading up to Trotsky's assassination in August of 1940. Trotsky asked himself, would things have been better if Trotsky had been the leader? He was the obvious alternative. And he wrote, the real question is, is democracy. Yes, Trotsky had a more interesting mind than Stalin. Trotsky was a brilliant guy, widely read, wrote about art and literature. Trotsky had a more interesting mind. But the real issue is democratic values. Once you reject democratic values, Stalin or someone like Stalin is inevitable. That's what, George, that's what Orwell wrote. 
And so there was something about Stalin and Lenin and Trotsky, their rejection of democratic values that led to such dramatic, sinister uh, endings for these you know, results, consequences. But Stalin took it many more steps than they were prepared to go. Trotsky would never have destroyed the officer corps on the eve of World War II. Stalin killed 30,000 officers. 30,000 in the midst of European crisis. Um, I'll just end one more little piece of the book uh, we haven't discussed. I did examine how the Western press covered Stalin's death. The New York Times, the London Times, Le Monde, Figaro, and others. And it's amazing you know, what they got wrong. Their very myopic view. Of course, they didn't know then in 53 what we know now, to be fair. But there was a column in the New York Times that Stalin was a military genius. Stalin was not a military genius. The Hitler-Stalin pact created a common border between Germany and the Soviet Union. There used to be something called Poland, which was a natural buffer zone between Germany and the Soviet Union. You couldn't attack the Soviet Union without going through Poland. Stalin dismantled that buffer zone and created a common frontier and made it possible for Hitler to assemble an army. Remember, there are no satellites overhead anymore yet. So it was all done in, in, from the German point of view, very cleverly. And they took Stalin by surprise. That would not have been possible if Poland had existed separately as a, you know, as a buffer zone. And anyway, there are many things very strange about how his death was covered in the Western press. Thank you. Joshua, do you see parallels between Stalin and Putin and what might happen if Putin was to get a spoken down? Well, I, you know, I want to resist. I do want to resist these parallels. Um, you know, the borders are still open. People are fleeing Russia. They're going to Georgia. They're going to Lithuania. They're going to Latvia. The churches and synagogues and mosques are still open. Putin does not feel threatened by religion in general. Um, but any independent voice like Nove Gazeta, a very wonderful newspaper, et cetera, got the Nobel Prize, and other, there was a radio station at Echo Moscovi, Echo Moscow, that's all shut down. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, this I believe is the most dangerous moment of the whole period of de Stalinization. But is Putin Stalin? I, I, I don't want to go there. I just don't want to go there. It's a different time. Um, it's, the question is, what is his ultimate goal? I think his ultimate goal probably is to reconstitute a portion of the Russian Empire that are Slavic, Slavic areas, Ukraine, Belarusia, North Kazakhstan. I'll remind you, in the fall of 1990, Alexander Solzhenitsyn wrote a, an essay, Kaka Bustroy Brasil, How to Reconstruct Russia. And he said, you know, we're not going to be able to keep the whole Soviet Union together. But we should at least have Russia, Ukraine, Belarus, and North Kazakhstan, because those have Russian-speaking populations. So that is an idea that was floating, that has been floating around even before Putin took power. People are oriented toward Russian nationalism. And this war is an, is an outgrowth of Russian imperialism. And one of the great achievements of Lenin and Trotsky, from their point of view, that they reconstituted the Russian Empire into the Soviet Union. And that was in question after the revolution and the Civil War. But they were able to reconstitute the Russian Empire. That collapsed. Russia with Ukraine is an empire. Russia without Ukraine is a country. And that is not something Russian imperialists can easily Acknowledge or accept. Yes. 
quick question. Please. One, one is about what you said about the open window and so forth. How realistic was that at the time of Bukharkis in the United States, number one? Second question was a lot of literature, previous literature about the period post-Stalin talks about a conflict, once Berea is gone, conflict with Malenkov, between Malenkov and Khrushchev. Um, any comments on that? Yeah, first about Malenkov is already uh, you know, set aside by 1954. And Khrushchev is, is really the heir apparent. Um, he doesn't have all the right titles yet, but he's really in charge. And later on in 57, Molotov and Kaganovich, who still were among the leaders, they also tried to challenge Khrushchev and he won out and they retired peacefully. The fact that they were able to retire, retire peacefully is a tribute to Khrushchev and to the, the kind of gentleman's agreement they all had. And after they killed Beria, everybody would be safe. Keep in mind, these men who had worked with Stalin worked with him under great fear. They knew they were his potential victims until his collapse on March 1st. So that was part of the psychology uh, around Khrushchev. What was your first question? Question about the open window and the yes. and, and Again, McCarthy. that was another fact. But Eisenhower was fed up with McCarthy and doing his best to undo him. And although McCarthy tried to get in the way, for example, of appointing uh, Charles Boland to be the ambassador in Moscow, why? Because Boland had been a translator, a translator for Roosevelt and Truman at Yalta and at Potsdam, as if thereby Boland was at fault for what the Democrats had given up to Stalin. So he wanted to blame Boland for that. Now Eisenhower would have known. Bones uh, appointment went through. But yes, that was another factor that could have been in the way of Eisenhower. Eisenhower hated McCarthy, but he couldn't ignore it. Josh, we have a question on Zoom from Laurent, um, who says, I'd like to ask Joshua, April 2019, uh, Levada Center for revealed that 79% of Russians approved of Stalin's role. Um, how can you explain this? I guess more broadly, can you talk about the contemporary view of Stalin? Well, that was the, the first Levada poll. Levada uh, was initially, for many years, completely independent, completely independent polling service in Moscow, very respected. It lost its independence, but it still exists, and its polling is more or less still seen as legitimate. The problem is that all the propaganda in the country has shifted. Everything that Gorbachev had achieved by opening the archives, by allowing Memorial to be created, an anti-Stalinist group dedicated to documenting the crimes of Stalin, all of that has been put aside. So the population has been fed all this, this propaganda. Now, the, there is no direct denial that Stalin had some dark side. That's not being directly denied. But what is being elevated is his role in World War II in a very particular way. You can't talk about the pact. It's as if it never existed. You can't talk about the consequence of the pact, the military reversals in the first months of 19, the summer and fall of 1941. Millions of Soviet soldiers were captured and killed for the complete incompetence of Soviet generals and the generalissimo, Stalin himself. None of that is discussed. So Stalin has come to represent the heyday of Soviet imperialism, Soviet might, of Soviet grandeur, as represented by the victory over Nazi Germany. That's all they've got. What are they supposed to celebrate? Collectivization, the purging of the army, his removal from the mausoleum. I see no initiative to exhume him from his grave and put him back next to Lenin. I don't think that's going to happen. Plus, what would they use? So it's this very strange netherworld. What do people know? What do they believe? What can they celebrate? I'm very curious what's going to happen on March 5th in Moscow. I'm very curious. 
Will the communists be allowed to be in the streets to celebrate 70 years in a positive way? Will the victims of Stalin be able to gather in front of the Lubyanka in central Moscow, light candles, read the names the way they've been doing for years? Very unlikely. So that's the atmosphere in which these polls are taking place. You know, countries can get caught up in an imperialistic mood. It's happened in our country. America. It happens in France, in democratic countries. Think of all the, the turmoil over the, the leaving Algeria in the late 50s, early 60s. These are hard things for countries to accept. But defeat is a hard thing for a country to accept. Um, and there are ramifications of that, even in democratic notions. Thank you. We have time for one more question. It's a very short one. If you wouldn't mind just saying, you're talking about this idea of the um, of the pact between Russia and um, and Nazi Germany. Well, Mr. Putin is wants to denazify Ukraine, and nobody talks about how Russia was once the partner of the Nazi themselves. Right. Not not only in Russia, I don't know, but in our countries. It's all under the carpet. It's rarely raised. Well, I don't think, you know, I, I think people, I think in some of the, at least in the States where I read our newspapers, um, and there are comments about dismissing Putin's denunciation of Ukraine, just by the assault as we're here to denazify Ukraine when as a, a Jewish president. And I mean, it's absurd from a historical point of view. And people raised that it was the Soviet Union under Stalin that actually was in alliance with Nazi Germany in a very effective alliance for those two years. Uh -huh. uh, that isn't raised. And certainly Putin's not raising it. But the Western press has mentioned it as part of its dismissal. But it's not an issue they're going to keep repeating every time there's an argument. Biden's been in, in Kiev this week. Is there a place where, where it should be part of the news commentary that, well, the Red Army liberated Kiev from the Nazis in 1944. Um, the Nazis invaded. They were thrown out by the Red Army. Now we have a Jewish president. The current U Ukraine has, has behaved honorably in Babi Yar. I mean, you know, it's, it's very hard to bring up these, this history every time. But I think it, it certainly has been mentioned. You know, many Americans, I can say, don't have a very strong sense of history. They do not have a strong sense of history. And much, many of our political leaders also either don't, or if they do, they want us to forget it. I mean, AK, look what's happening in Florida. Um, if you're not following the news, we have a governor who doesn't want uh, Black history or history of Blacks in America to be properly discussed, examined. For some reason, he finds that very troubling, very challenging. So history, you know, what did Orwell say? So he who controls the future, he who controls the present controls the future. Who, he who controls the future controls the past. 